you have little ones in your family under about four feet tall and they want to go hear the story on a different level, Linda is out in the narthex, and so you're welcome to join her if you want to. Easter eggs come after the service. All right. So happy Easter. Happy Easter. My Aunt Kay and Uncle Bill live in Nashville, Tennessee, and my aunt has this uncanny ability to send cards for absolutely every occasion that Hallmark has come up with. And um, it used to be in college that she would send a little uh, adult beverage money along with those cards. Um, but I had to grow up and no longer do I get that. But the good part is she still sends funny cards and I got an Easter card and, and on the front of this card, this is the only card actually that she's ever sent me I could share in a sermon. But um, <laughs> the front is this picture of church and a long line of people going in and, and, and it, it says Easter is a time we gather in church and then you open up the card and it says to see if they've done anything to the place since Christmas. <laughs> this is only my third time in this pulpit, so the good news is that if you haven't been here since Christmas, I don't know the difference. <laughs> what I do know is that this is a community of love. You have welcomed me like I have never imagined. So whoever you are, wherever you are on your faith journey, welcome home. It doesn't matter what you do, or what you wear, or what kind of family you come from. Welcome home to this modern family. Hallelujah. So, I don't know what is different in this place since Christmas, except the preacher. And the fact that in church we've heard a lot of stories about Jesus. Since his birth in Bethlehem. How he grew up in the carpenter's home and got lost in the temple that time. He started preaching and teaching and healing and all these crowds started forming and he realized he needed some help, so he went down the ocean and found 12 good fisher folk to help him out. They followed him everywhere he went, knuckleheads that they were from time to time. He tried to teach them about the love of God. Sometimes they got it, and sometimes they didn't. Because Jesus loved to preach in these stories. Sometimes they were confusing, and they were hard to analyze for the disciples. <clears throat> the authorities get a little weary of this guy and all the people that are following him. This guy's claiming to be a king. So they bring him to trial. The crowd rises up and tells their leader that they want this Jesus guy dead. And so he gives the order. He is killed on the cross outside of Jerusalem. Some folks did the right thing and wanted to honor him, and they wrapped his body in a linen shroud and found a tomb and laid him there. Turns out a lot has changed since Christmas. And now we've just heard that these faithful women go to this tomb. They go to this tomb to anoint Jesus' body. And when they arrive, they find that he is not there. There are these two men there, and the original Greek language is kind of funny. It says they are wearing gleam, flinging, flashing attire. Why seek ye the living among the dead, they say. He is not here, he is risen. This is the miracle of Easter, my friends. And so the women run from the tomb to the disciples to tell all of them they must have been paralyzed with fear and amazement. But the disciples thought the women were just telling idle stories. Again, the Greek is funny. The disciples thought what the women were saying was oblivion gush, or nonsense. Kind of like the stories your crazy aunt and uncle might tell you around the dinner table. The Bible was written hundreds and thousands of years ago by people who may or may not have actually been there and witnessed what happened. They may have heard it from someone else who had heard it from their 
grandfather who had only been in the crowd when all of this happened. It's like that game of telephone. Do you remember you used to sit in a circle and you tell one person next to it and you pass it around and then by the end that last person had to tell the whole story and it may or may not resemble what the first kid said? How do we know what the people in the Bible actually said? How do we know it's not all idle tale? The obvious and yet disappointing answer is that we really don't. Scholars will be arguing about what Jesus did and said and who he was until he comes back. Arguing about when the Gospels were written, by whom, what the Lost Scrolls actually said. That is all fine and dandy work for them. But what does it mean for us? It means that we have been given this thing called faith for a reason. It means we need to come here this morning to keep telling and hearing the story and community because this is like a family reunion of sorts for the children of God. This morning is about new life and resurrection, but it is also about coming home. On Easter day, my family used to gather out in the country at my great-grandfather's house. The rest of the family got there first and ate the good stuff because they were Baptists and we were Episcopalians and had to stay in the church longer. But they all ate a huge lunch, ham, sweet potatoes with marshmallows on top, pound cake and deviled eggs, and sweet tea that my great-grandmother made. This was middle Georgia after all. She didn't measure the sugar. She just opened the bag and poured it in and knew how much. We'd sit on the screen porch afterwards. I can still hear the slam of that door. My great-grandfather would sit on the metal glider, you know those old good kind, and he would tell us stories. Stories about shooting the man who was trying to steal the chickens out of his coop, and the one about my dad who cut his toe off with the lawnmower. You know the stories. You have them in your family. The ones about the distant cousin of yours, twice removed, who actually stole the family Bible, or my college roommate's case, the crock pot. <laughs> We'd plot about how we could go break into their house and steal it back. It was ours after all. Those are the stories we hear every year. They were never quite the same. They seem to get better every year. Some new detail would arise that would change the story in some way. We come here to this sacred place over and over and over again to keep sharing the story, our story, to keep witnessing to the truth we believe, because every year when we hear these stories, they never seem quite the same, do they? Because in some way, since the last time we were here, be it yesterday or Friday or Sunday or Christmas, somehow we have been changed by the love of God since the last time we gathered. And the stories have new meaning in our liberated lives. The stories we experience and share in our faith community show us over and over and over again that God chooses life. God always gets the last word, and the last word is always, always love. It is the beginning, the middle, and the end. Love. We moved our font out yesterday when we were decorating for Easter because we are reminded during this season of our baptism. We go down into the water and are buried with Christ symbolically. It may seem scary, but God chooses life for us and raises us out of the waters to new resurrected life in Christ. We commit to remaining in community and being witnesses to the story, sharing with those who do not know it, that God earnestly desires to give them life and salvation through Christ. We keep on teaching and learning and breaking bread together and sharing the stories with our children. We keep on messing up and trying to do better, repenting and then proclaiming. 
We strive to love each other and seek the best for our neighbors, doing something about it. And we beg the Holy Spirit to give us grace and strength along the journey. Perhaps, my friends, you need to struggle with the details of the Easter story. But I can't explain the resurrection and the story. I just know that it is not an idle tale. Rather, I believe that the resurrection explains us. It is not about the facts. It is about the power of God. God who brought about creation in powerful and unexplainable ways. God who brings prisoners out of enslavement by sin into new life and the promised land flowing with milk and honey. God who made covenants and promised new life. God who gives us that new life in Jesus. God did it through tales we can never explain. But God did it all out of love for us. To make a way where there seems to be no way. So now we each have a choice. You can live your life trying to explain the details of the story, or you can live this life you've been giving as if you believe the Easter story. There is no way to explain it, but we are called to witness the love that we experience and lose track of time in spreading that love to all those we encounter. We are liberated. No longer in the tomb. This Easter is ours too, if we choose to follow the risen Christ. How do I know that it is true? Not the same way that I know the sun will rise again in the morning. No, I know it because my grandparents and parents and Sunday school teachers told me so. I know it because I've heard 37 Easter sermons attesting to the fact. I've seen countless lives of faith lived as witnesses to the tales. In two weeks in this community, I've already seen followers of Christ reaching out and caring for one another in the hospital, being with those who are receiving chemo, rejoicing with those who are finished receiving chemo, I've seen the people here show up and have a potluck meal of love I would never have expected. I've seen 13 people gather on a Sunday morning to transform this place from an image of darkness to an image of new life. I've heard some of your stories. My faith is built on nothing less than the love of Jesus that a great cloud of witnesses has shown me. And so that's all I can do today is share the story that you and that the world were rocked by the birth of Jesus at Christmas. And this morning, that the world is rocked by the resurrection. Jesus is not here. He is risen. Jesus is on the loose. Be on the lookout. Choose life and pass the story on. Because I promise you, the people you share the story with will be amazed at what happened.